thank you very much indeed for coming along and joining this uh, this meeting this evening. Of course, we're blessed with uh, this sunshine. Uh, we, we, you know, it was a risk whether we could, we're going to be able to take you into the other room and remove everything out of there to have it all to to uh, to run the gauntlets and have it underneath this canopy. So it's worked out well. I'm hoping that uh, this evening that we all become a little bit more enlightened as to what the current situation is and what we're all facing with regards to the National Grid. My name's Clive Knowles, I'm the Chairman of the British Ironworks Centre and it's a, I'm very, very grateful for you all turning up tonight. It's wonderful to see so many friendly faces. Um, I'm going to hand you over now to Jonathan who's going to bring up each speaker in turn but I would like to say that for the people that have got these sort of personal circumstances that they would like to be heard then everybody's welcome to speak and I'm sure everybody's going to be extremely interested to hear what they have to say. So please, you know, if you want to speak, please let it be known. Thank you Clive um, and welcome everybody. Really good to see some familiar faces and a few new faces as well. Um, it's, uh, it's a big fight this. It's involving Mid Wales and Shropshire and what I all want you to go from here tonight with is is the knowledge that uh, we're united in this fight uh, and that I think we're stronger because of that uh, and I think we can help each other. Uh, I want the people from Shropshire that are here to know that they're not fighting this alone, uh, far from it, uh, and that, but I think that you know, we are depending as much on you guys uh, as you are on us. Uh, many thanks to Clive for hosting this tonight. Um, I, think, I think of Clive as my lucky charm because whenever we have an event here, uh, he seems to be blessed with good weather, so I, I'm going to stick with Clive. I think he's, uh, he's going to sort of help us a great deal in this campaign. Um, fortunate enough tonight to have uh, three speakers, and, and welcome any, anybody who wants to speak later on. Charles Green from the Alliance. For those of you who've been following the public inquiry at uh, the Oak in Welsh Pool, which has been running for virtually 12 months, um, Charles has played a key role here in, in co coordinating that Alliance campaign. It's been a huge task, uh, and the breadth of that task was acknowledged in the final session of the inquiry the other day in the Oak Welsh Pool, uh, when the inspector unusually paid tribute uh, to the huge community effort uh, that he's witnessed um, in that inquiry, and, and the, the organisation, and it's been done on the shoestring, but it's obviously left a, a lasting impression on the inspector. How that pans out into an eventual decision, of course, with no way of knowing. Um, but one thing's for sure, had the Alliance not been there, making that case loud and clear for thousands in the communities in Shropshire and uh, Mid Wales, we would have been hung out to dry, I think. Um, so it's critically important. So I think a huge thank you to, uh, to everybody in the Alliance. <laughs> Charles also chairs SNAP, Shropshire North Against Pylons, and uh, they work closely with, uh, with me and, uh, and Matt Montgomery Against Pylons, and it's that link between the groups that has given us such strength, I think. We also have Councillor Mabami Alexander, uh, County Councillor with Paris County Council, and she's been there from the beginning in the MAP campaign for sure. Uh, she's personally affected by the um, National Grid uh, pylon line proposal, um, but at the other end, and she'll want to talk about her feelings, how she sees the, um, the campaign developing uh, and uh, where we're heading. And finally to, last but not least, Glyn Davis, our MP, who was really way ahead of the game and had identified uh, the looming problems with the large-scale wind development in Mid Wales long before I was aware of it for sure. He'd seen the development of Welsh Government's TAN-8 policy, uh, which, which identified areas, uh, strategic search areas for wind farm development in Wales, and really led to the whole problem that we're, we're witnessing now. So with, uh, without any more ado, I'm going to ask Charles if he'll come and speak to you um, about the campaign as he sees it so far. Charles. I don't need to introduce myself then because Jonathan's already done it but it, as he says I 
Well, I got into this partly because I uh, was a landowner in the corridor, but the, 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 the narrowed corridor misses me. Um, because of a previous campaign, uh, I was put forward as the coordinator for the Alliance, the, the central point of contact, and that's why I've spent the last 18 months, I should think, on this public inquiry, which the first salvo of which started in November 2012, and the, the last session finished on Friday, this last Friday, although I have to say I was still submitting documents today. Um, so there's been a total of, I think, 50 sitting days. It's been the, the biggest wind farm public inquiry there has ever been. As Jonathan says, the inspector, the result now is that the inspector has to write a report. He said, although he's very nice and um, the Alliance got a round of applause, etc., etc., our barrister says, beware the nodding judge. So there's the proof of the pudding is in the eating. He said he's going to write his report as soon as possible. As soon as possible turns out to be no earlier than the end of September. Uh, the report then goes to to um, what's called decision officers in in DEC, Department of in, of um, Energy and Climate Change, which is Ed Davies' department. He notionally is the person who makes the decision, but it's it's essentially made for him beforehand by these unnamed civil servants um, and they will sit on that report for an indeterminate length of time there's no actual deadline for them to to put forward their report um, and there's some thought that because the election is coming up next year it might be sidelined until after that anyway so what I'm saying is don't hold your breath for, for the report but the reason we're spending we've you know, the Alliance and MAP and SNAP and, and CUP, Conservation of Upland Powers, have, have, have been in this game of fighting wind farms for nigh on 20 years. Um, the reason we're fighting the wind farms, of course, is that um, without the wind farms, there will be no pylon line. If the wind farms go ahead, there will be a pylon line. So it's no good, it's no good thinking you'll defeat National Grid unless you defeat the wind farms. The, the public inquiry has involved four of the wind farms that are signed up or that, that National Grid have a duty to connect if they, if they become connected. Um, but, but the National Grid scheme that we are fighting and that is going to sail over Clive's Sculpture Park if it comes, um, there, are, there are 10 wind farms signed up to that National Grid scheme. And I say in the in the public inquiry so far, which we've been dealing with for over a year, that it's only four of those wind farms, so there are still six out there which have yet got to be defeated. Um, and of course all that, I'm afraid, costs money. We're still looking for donations. If anyone has any loose change in their pocket, we'd be very grateful if you could put it in that, that gold box over by the cameraman on your way out <laughs> everything will be appreciated um, because I've been so involved in this public inquiry my wife decided that if she was going to see anything of me she would have to come for the public inquiry as well she's out there somewhere <laughs> because she's an artist she spent her time drawing the, the subjects of the public inquiry and has produced a book, a specimen of which is also by that gold box. If any, what we thought we might do is, um, if people want it, they might perhaps make a donation to SNAP. The book at the moment is only, there's only a couple of pages there on display, because of course what we will do is send it to people electronically. So if you give us your email address, we'll send it to you if you make a donation to SNAP. Um, National Grid, we've, of course, we keep our eye on them all the time. We know they've been about and doing their surveys, etc., etc. 
we thought we were going to have a, a night, or I thought I was going to have a nice little lull. In fact, my wife's taking me away on holiday tomorrow, so I suspect the weather will change tomorrow. <laughs> um, but National Grid, with impeccable timing, have put, have now put into the, the planning inspectorate the first formal documentation starting their process of getting their, their planning permission, which is, it's not, it's called a, um, a development consent order, it's not strictly planning permission. But their, the document that they put in is called a scoping report, which is, they are essentially asking the, the consultees, like, like Matt, Snap, Shopshire Council, Etc. Anyone who has who has previously been involved in commenting on their proposals, they are essentially asking them what should be in their final report. So, so we now have an opportunity to make sure that that stuff goes into their final report. There is a, um, a slight dilemma here. We don't actually want to tell them what should be in their final report. What we want to do is is devise any tactics we can to make it more difficult for them. So, the, in, the, in the public inquiry, the alliance has been largely um, campaign groups that are, that are wind farm related, but it, it now is obvious that we need to get our act together. All the, all the groups along the national grid line, MAP and LAG and and SNAP and all the others, we need to get our act together fairly quickly because we only have 28 days to comment on this report. We only are able to see it uh, electronically. It's a document that is 70 megabytes large, so a lot of people may not be able to download that. Can, actually, can you put your hands up? Anyone who thinks they might have difficulty with their internet downloading a document that is 70 megabytes large. What does that contain? In pages, that's 352 pages. <laughs> now, I'm, thank you, that's about half the people here, I should think, cannot download such a document. Now, I think it's, it's incumbent on, on them to supply us with hard copies, really. I don't know whether... Does anybody know, for instance, when the Shropshire Council have got a hard copy, or are you obliged to, to download it and, and print it out yourselves? I think we're obliged to download it. Yes, yeah. Well, I don't think that's on, really. But I don't know what we can do about that. But I'd say that, that is where we find ourselves at the moment. That, that one stage of the campaign is over. We've we've done all we can to fight the the wind farm public inquiry, uh, which is almost death by paperwork. I think the program officer said there have been thirteen hundred um, thirteen hundred documents had come out, and the you know the, the three hundred and fifty two pages that I've just mentioned is is nothing compared to some of the documents that, that we and our barrister have had to, had to read through. Um, so there's another round coming up now where we will have to look very carefully at all this National Grid documentation that's come out now. So I tell you, we still have, from the, from the public inquiry, we still have bills to pay. We will need professional advice for what's coming up in front of us from National Grid. So anything you can do to help by emptying your pockets would be gratefully received. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. The Alliance campaign was funded entirely from donations. It's been an incredible achievement. When you looked at the ranks of barristers on the um, side of the applicants, uh, you know, we could barely afford one barrister, and so the Alliance had to very quickly learn how to become barristers. It was no small feat. Um, but it has involved fundraising, that will be ongoing, and any of you feel inclined to give to SNAP, and it'll be hugely, uh, hugely welcome. 
Um, MAP, our organisation, uh, has donated well over £30,000 to that campaign um, and we will continue to try and help wherever we can. Um, we also continue to fundraise for our own fight against National Grid, um, always mindful of the fact that we may at some stage have to judicially view um, a decision that's made. I'll now introduce you to Mavami Alexander. Uh, a little bit of background without stealing any of her thunder about Paris County Council and their important part in this. There were two very large public rallies, uh, one of which at the Welsh Bull Livestock Market uh, was the first, as I understand, live screening uh, online of um, a Paris County Council meeting um, in its entirety in the decision. Um, that was uh, instrumental in forming the Paris County Council response um, to the wind farm uh, proposals in Mid Wales, um, unanimously um, rejected by Paris County Council. It was a momentous decision and got us to the stage where we had a public inquiry to look into these proposals. So, you know, the role of Paris County Council in this that can't be underestimated. Uh, obviously, you know, there have been political uh, and they continue to be, um, but you know we hope that the resolve of the council, um, you know, continues and strengthens because you know they're very important allies in this battle. Anyway, I'll hand you over now to uh, to Mavamo. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd first like to say I have to say that because I am a county councillor and may sit on wind farm applications, I would meet each. Uh, application uh, with a completely open mind and uh, as you will hear from the next 10 minutes or two minutes uh, of my conversation I have not made up my mind about wind farms ho 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 please don't minute the ho 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 um, I'd just like to start with um, telling you a bit about where I come from geographically and what things are like up there um, I represent uh, an area called the Banu Valley which are the villages of Royal Llangadvan and Llanerville. Uh, we are scattered rural communities. We are generally people, hill farming is the main occupation, although there's a fair bit of tourism. Sometimes I hear people say that the farmers in the hills want these schemes. It is a tiny minority of the farmers in the hills who want these schemes. The vast majority of the people in my ward, we took a plebiscite and on an 85% turnout, 89% opposed wind farms and 95% opposed pylons. Presumably the gap, the 6% thought that the power was going to leave the hills in a bucket. Um, but Charles has just said, wind farms mean pylons. And when you look at a beautiful tranquil scene like this, and you think how little power the desecration of this landscape would bring, it just makes you realise how important the fight is. You may see sometimes um, our friends from the wind farm industry say this wind farm could power 8,000 homes. Theoretically, a gallon of, gallon of petrol could power 2,000 cars if you put one drop in with a pipette. But actually, nothing that comes from those hills on wind farms will keep the lights on. They don't provide the power that we need for the future, and the whole thing is a scam. In Paris County Council, we've already spent three million pounds defending uh, our country side against wind farms. And given that we've got 40 million pounds worth of cuts to make in two years, we have to make some very, very hard decisions. But to give you an idea of how we feel about this, we adopted a new local development plan to go out for consultation just 10 days ago. Um, the planners, in their wisdom, decided that we would, quote, support any renewable energy project which benefited a rural business. Basically, that would have been an open door to farm turbines covering the whole of Powys. You'll be pleased to know that the councils of Powys County Council threw that out and told the planners to think again. We come from an area quite away from here, but we share exactly the same problems, the same issues. It just occurred to me that uh, looking at this landscape and, and looking at it unscarred, if the scar goes across this landscape, it will open up a wound which will bleed the Montgomery countryside to death. 
Charles talks about the 10 large wind farms. There are currently 70, 70 wind farm schemes of various sizes in the planning process in Paris. Now, we are determined that we will hold the line as far as we possibly can. And with regard to the plans of National Grid, if you, you'll um, forgive me, I'll, I'll reminisce. I grew up in a village called Kevin Cork, which you may have heard of. Uh, and one of my father's greatest friends was a farmer named Thomas Edward Watkin. Thomas didn't believe in Land Rovers because he had a faithful pony called Polly. Uh, Thomas lived in a house without electricity. Uh, he had a little well, a lovely little pond in front with, which was full of newts and it was full of flags and irises. He was the image of the Good Shepherd from your children's Bible. National Grid proposes within a quarter of a mile of Thomas's cottage, Thomas having now left us, to build a 20 acre electricity substation. These plans are so out of kilter with our environment. And again, just on the subject of greedy farmers, I have at least two friends who have turned down figures in excess of a million pounds because the, to them the landscape is more important than cash. Um, a friend of mine said that to him, uh, you could count in your family um, finances how much money you'd get if your wife worked as a tart, but you'd only do it if it was a choice of that or starve. And many farmers in my part of the world will not prostitute their landscape. And the other thing... Talking to a friend of mine who is a small farmer, wants to build up a farm to pass them on to his two sons. He's really struggling and the reason why he's struggling is because the price of land in the hills has gone through the roof. Because the wealthy, greedy landowners are now able to buy land at twice the price. So when he wants to build up a small holding to pass on to his son, he can't. Because of the scam of money that's coming in through these developments. We know, ladies and gentlemen, what we need to do. We need to stand firm. And we need to remember that this landscape means more to us than their money means to them. And in reality, they will go away and make money somewhere else, doing something else, if we stand firm. I could not believe two years ago that we would get to the point that we are now. We are winning the argument. Two years ago, uh, Glyn and, and a couple of his, his colleagues were voices crying in the wilderness. It's now a mainstream opinion to think that onshore wind is nothing but a scam and a waste of money. In the meantime, what can we do? You may have national grid surveyors come into your part of the world. They're certainly in my part of the world. Watch them. Monitor them. Remember that the environmentalists they're sending out can't tell the difference between a rare bat and a punch in the throat, and they're more likely to get the latter than the former. We know this land, we love this land, and this land means something to us. So we have the trump card in any fight. We have held them off so far, and it's now getting to the large main part of the fight. But we have the love of the land and the knowledge and the commitment. We're in it for the long term and we're going to win. Thank you, Mark. She's not a lone voice in Paris County Council and there are many more who feel exactly as she does and uh, you know, we're very grateful to them. It's a very political battle this now at the very highest level and David Cameron has stated his position um, quite clearly. Um, it was probably pretty timely in that it coincided with the European elections uh, a week or so ago, but nevertheless he, he stated quite clearly that if there was a, they had a majority at the next election, then there would be a moratorium on large onshore wind, which would of course um, put an end to, to our problems. Um, I explained this to, to National Grid the other day. National Grid, whenever I meet them, want to say, well, this is inevitable, it's going to happen, and accept it for what it is. It's far from inevitable. Um, don't let National Grid um, try and kid you that it is. Um, I will hand over now to, to uh, our MP, Glyn Davis. Thank you.
thank you, Jonathan. And I'd like to start by um, thanking Clive for organising it and inviting me here. I don't think I've ever spoken in such a weird place in my life before. <laughs> um, I think when you're in the House of Commons, you've got some pretty weird people looking down on you. And I must say, the people in that field um, make be a, look, they look a bit threatening. Maybe they. I tell you what, when we next have National Grid in up in Kevin Cook, can we borrow all this? I <laughs> The champion around the building, that'll put the wind up them. Anyway, I, 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 I've been involved in this issue for actually nine years. Um, I, was never, I wasn't particularly concerned about um, onshore wind farms at all. Uh, I, I must have instructions to hold my microphone a bit lower. Thanks a lot. And where would I, what, what would I do without you? Um, and uh, I was the spokesman for the um, Conservative Party in the National Assembly when the government announced a new um, TAN-8 policy. I was in 2005, and uh, I thought about it for a while, and uh, I talked to Peter Ogden, who was the chief executive of, of, or the director of the campaign for the protection of <coughs> rural Wales, and Peter told me what it meant, and basically what it meant in terms of the line. I mean, you can have a discussion about wind farms, but how the hell are you getting the power out? And the logic is, once you build the line, which would be dedicated, that means that the few wind farms you have to start with are only ever going to be a start. The, what we're talking about really is probably about 25 wind farms. The capacity of the line over a period of years. And the scale of this just horrified me and I, I became absolutely anti it. And it, for, a few, for a few years, I, I, I wasn't in the majority really. I, I, I was involved in several debates, two or three of them televised on cross language television, and I lost every one. I, I mean, I was, always, I was in a minority, a majority of people thought wind farms were great. and. Um, and it, but he didn't quite understand what it meant. But then, I don't know how long ago it was, three, four, five years, whatever. But we saw what it meant. What it meant in terms of the substation, what it meant in terms of the pylons. I haven't lost a debate since. I mean, since people understood just what that policy meant for Mid Wales, what we found, I think, is a huge majority of the people in Mid Wales who absolutely agree with the view that um, I've been taking. Though I quite like sometimes to come to an event, some of the events we've had, and because I can do a pretty good rant if I want to. If I get warmed up, I can sort of let fly. I'm not sure absolutely what I say, but I don't think it matters much. I've ranted in the House of Commons once or twice. Uh, I mean, the transcript looks absolutely bloody awful. But it was quite good, especially when I was about two foot behind a minister. It, was quite, it, it worked quite well there. But Mavanwi is so good at ranting. But, um, I thought I probably ought to leave the rant to one side today. I'm talking about something that comes a bit more, a bit more serious. I, mean, I, I may, I, perhaps, uh, I hope not that I don't sound too dreary, but um, I think it is moving to a stage now when it's getting all a bit more critical. And I think policy comes into this, and policy at a Westminster level is what's going to decide it. So I, I mean, what I thought I'd try to do is, is try to explain um, where we are with this now. And I, all, all along, since the very beginning, where we've been is the same position that we, Mick Jonathan explained. Everybody said, not, not, it's not just national grid. A lot of my friends have said, well, they're going to get their own way in the end. When I get, and the government wants to do something, you can make as much fuss and much bother as you like, but they'll get their own way in the end. So you might as well give up in the beginning. But a hell of a lot of people didn't accept that. And they've not given up. And it's only because they didn't give up that we got ourselves to a position that I think is a, a lot more optimistic. Because all, all the way up through this, if you'd have asked me nine years ago, I would have said, well, I think this is a very bad policy, but it's almost certainly going to happen. Uh, probably about five or six years ago, I started, well, well since the, we saw the protest, the first meeting in Welsh School absolutely staggered me, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I just turned up expecting to see three, four hundred people there, I was probably not far short of two thousand. I felt good actually, I was up on top of a bale, I felt like Rod Stewart, you know, because everybody was cheering and shouting, and then we all went to Cardiff and it was even better. I, mean, I announced my name in Cardiff and the whole place roared with approval. Oh, I wish I'd been a pop star, but there we are. I wasn't. But anyway, we didn't do that, and I, I, I said we were in with a chance of winning this. Since so many people were fighting for this, it was having a, a, a reaction on politics, I thought we were in with a chance of winning it. And then about, I must have four or five weeks ago, I said, and I meant it, I said that I think now we're going to win this battle. And I know there's one or two people close to the uh, campaign who, um, they know I choose my words pretty carefully. And it wasn't just a casual comment. 
I do think we're going to win this battle. It, nothing's guaranteed, of course, but um, I spent a lot of time trying to understand where we are. And there's two aspects to it. One is where coalition policy is now. And I think for about the first time I feel fairly confident that I can stand up and I can support coalition policy. I, I mean, we have a renewable energy policy at, as a Westminster government of delivering 15% uh, of our energy by 2020 from renewable sources. That is the, that's the target that's been there. I think Tony Blair actually signed up to that target. I don't think he quite knew what he was doing. It's a far more difficult target to meet than was sensible. But I think we're going to meet that target. We've already, there's, a, there's already enough renewable energy approved to meet that target. We're beyond the target that we've set. The National Grid have got way, way beyond anything that they can meet in terms of permissions through for various forms of renewable energy. And even if we look at onshore wind as a separate part of it, what we find, I, I mean, the figures for onshore wind, I, I, I happen to know that the target the government has is between 10 and 13 gigawatts or, or maybe 11 and 30, it's very. There's actually probably 14 already through planning are actually operating or, or have got by permission. I mean, we met the target. There's absolutely no case at all for any more. And why that's important is that so many planning applications are decided. The inspector listens to all the argument, he listens to the alliance, he listens to the map, and he says, well, you may have won every argument, but the government's target trumps all that and we approve it. That's what's happened across the country's territory. But that's no longer the case because the targets have been met. And I can comfortably say that it's quite, it's quite probably novel on me that I'm four square behind government policy on this issue. But the, the issue that is um, a lot more, and I, I, this is where I have to be a bit more careful what I say. I, I know that I've seen Ian and John here. So I, before you report anything, I wouldn't mind having a chat because I'm not absolutely certain what's known publicly and what I happen to know and I shouldn't. So I just wouldn't mind that what you, what you say. But the system of subsidizing um, wind farms is changing. This isn't just conservative policy, this is coalition policy. Currently it's subsidized through what are called ROCs, renewable energy certificates. Now then, that system is coming to an end, I think, in April 2017. I mean, moving to a system what's called contract, contracts for difference. <laughs> now this is a double goop to an awful lot of people. But the system of subsidizing wind farms or renewable energy project in the future will be paid by a completely different system. There will be a lump sum, a pot available. And all the forms of energy for it. So it will be a limited lump sum. They will have to bid for this sum of money. And the, and the, and the truth of it is, they're going to run out of money very, very quickly. And you're going to find nothing like the number of wind. And the, what this is going to do to the confidence of wind farm companies. I mean, from getting permission, all the cost, and they don't actually qualify, until, they don't qualify until they actually sign up. They don't know whether they're, they're going to get this, because only a certain number of these projects, and it's those that offer the best value to government, they will get them. So it's going to put so much uncertainty, I think that's going to cause a huge amount of damage, and then damage the confidence hugely. But the other part of it is the political aspect, because I'm a, I have to be fairly optimistic, and I think there's a reasonable chance of there being a, another Conservative government in 2015. Or maybe, I'm not even certain, it'll be that difference if there's a coalition. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry if you couldn't hear. Maybe I should get rid of the mic and just shout and go switch into rant mode. I don't know. I'm not used to, I'm not used to mics. Yeah, I, I prefer to, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with it. Wave at me if I'm not doing it properly. But the, the Conservative Party position, um, definitely if we form the government, and I think possibly if we, um, if we were in a coalition, is that as soon as we were elected, we would acknowledge that the number of wind farms that have been approved is, uh, if those that are through the system will be fine. But if they haven't got permission, by November of 2015, no more will be approved. Unless they are a community project where there's got general support, or projects of that sort. Yeah. That's the one aspect of it. And the other aspect is the planning aspect, where decisions on wind farms will be decided by the local authority. They won't go to appeal. You won't have government suddenly coming and overturning it on appeal. 
But the planning position will be that if the local authority says no, <coughs> it'll be no. Well, I suddenly, you, you're immediately going to find that wind farm companies are not going to want to put applications in. Because they only put them in in mid at the moment, knowing the local authority is going to say no. So they're going to win on appeal. Well, that process will be taken away. And I just think that collection, because we don't know who's going to win the next election, is up in the air. But I must say, the barrier of the companies must be just sitting there wondering, is this worth it? And I do think, I haven't spoken at all about the grid, about the national grid connection, which is the gross connection, which obviously is what concerns everybody here in, uh, in Shropshire. But that's, inter in, that's intricately linked with the wind farms. Now I know a lot of people may well think that if the, we have an approval, uh, if the inspector were to decide to approve the applications that are before him, that is, it, that's the end of the story. I don't think it is. First of all, if there's a, a judicial review, which might happen, and that will delay it even more, I think there'll be a lot of pressure on the minister not to approve it before the general election. And if they're not approved, they'll sue the system. So they wouldn't get approval. <laughs> So, I mean, I just think there's so much to pay for. National Grid, in my view, are, I mean, I do think they're a disgrace. I think that for a number of reasons that they're a disgrace. The way in which they've treated people, the way in which they've bullied people, they've trampled on land, I think is utterly shocking. They're a company that should be ashamed of themselves. They're spending billions, I, I heard that they spent 10 million pounds on this project already, and they know perfectly well that this project may not go ahead. They are cavalier with people's money because it's not their own. They know it's, it's, the, it's, it's the bill payers who are subsidizing it all. I mean, it is one of the most disgraceful behaviour of a public company that I've ever seen. They should be utterly ashamed of the way they behave. Oh, sorry, I was just getting into rant there a bit. Which I, uh, made my chair, which I kind of shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I've tried to outline a little bit why I think we've got a lot of grounds to be optimistic. And the only reason, the point I do want to make and finish with, is the only reason we got into this position is because an awful lot of people who cared about how beautiful Mid Wales is and how beautiful Shropshire is decided not to take that easy route of just, just shutting down and not challenging these important people. They decided to raise a lot of money. They decided to employ experts. They decided to fight to the nail. And there are people here who spent, who've given a big chunk of their lives to fight these proposals voluntarily. I get paid for what I do. They've done it voluntarily. I think it's one of those brilliant examples of people who made a commitment to care for their area that I've ever seen. And without them, we wouldn't be where we are now. I'm really pleased to see uh, councillors Keith Barrow and Arthur Walpole here this evening. Um, I think Shropshire, have, and Shropshire County Council have every reason to feel completely outraged by what's happening because they, had, they weren't properly consulted and they had no opportunity to feed back to Welsh Government um, at any stage until now um, the, you know, the objections uh, felt by local residents. So I think, I think you know, it's critically important to have Shropshire County Council as allies in this battle. Um, I'd like to hand over now to, uh, to Arthur Walpole. Testing. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as, uh, I've just been introduced. My name's Arthur Walpole. You hear me okay? At the back? Yeah? Get closer. Yeah. My name's Arthur Walpole. I'm a Shropshire councillor, as you've just heard said. Um, my patch is the area around here that, uh, that borders with Wales. The areas that you see talked about as far as the national grid connection is concerned, um, down th across the south side of Flanny Monarch, Flanny Monarch and Fant is part of my patch, Flanny Bodwell, Maysbrook, Melvilly, Kenley, Knockin. That's the area that I direct directly represent but I've also been working with other councillors and with Keith in particular, Keith Barrow here, 
to make sure that uh, Shropshire Council are on board in terms of its response to the proposals that uh, National Grid have been uh, putting forward. And uh, I'm extremely pleased to be part of this meeting. I'm sure Keith will want to have his say just now, he always does, and uh, look forward to hearing that uh, we still have his backing. I've attended previous meetings alongside of Keith and, and Owen Patterson, who as you know is our MP. I think most recently it was just prior to Christmas uh, last year, where we had a very good meeting at uh, the venue at Park Hall. Jonathan was along there and Clive and uh, uh, um, all, all the representatives from SNAP and, uh, and MAP as well. And we had a, a really successful meeting there, two or three hundred people there. So I think that indicates the fact that we have been involved in this previously and we are very supportive of the calls. Uh, we've made our position clear at Shropshire Council. Uh, I took a motion to Shropshire, a full council meeting uh, of uh, Shropshire's discussed at the proposals for the, uh, for the high voltage power line uh, to, to, pass through, to pass through Shropshire and that uh, received the full approval of, of our council. Uh, to demonstrate that we're greatly concerned about the detrimental effects that this would have, potentially would have, on Shropshire and the people who live in Shropshire and the people who visit Shropshire and work in Shropshire. Uh, we also made uh, a written submission to the Wind Farm Inquiry, setting out our concerns, as I've just said, that it would be a blight uh, on our communities if, if this line was to go ahead. And I'm sure you're all familiar already with the sort of aspects that that does affect. It affects property prices, it affects businesses, it affects tourism, it affects local, local immunity. And as well as setting out all that, we also made clear our concerns about the construction traffic. And for a number of years now, it's been a particular concern of people living on or close to the A483, that uh, the wind farm components uh, are, are due to pass along the A483 through a road that lots of you will already recognise is extremely congested, extremely narrow, with properties immediately adjacent to the road, being shaken by the lorries that pass through there already. And this is not a this is not a myth. As somebody that I know very well who's recently moved into rented accommodation because they're between selling and buying again has moved into a property in Lanny One of the first things they've said to me is that, my goodness, sir, you, walk, you walk upstairs, we're just looking around, and you feel the vibration from the passing lorries. This is a big, big issue uh, for those people. So we've drawn attention to that, uh, the effect that that construction traffic would have, those heavy loads passing along the A483. And obviously not just the fact that it shakes uh, everybody close to it, but also all the other frustrations that would be associated by the passage of these con convoys of huge vehicles, the interruptions that it would bring, the delays and the frustrations to everybody in the area, both the people who live there, the people who are visiting there, uh, and, and, and the prospect of the need for emergency services to pass along those roads, a big problem, a big issue for people. The other aspect that we drew attention to as well in our written submission was, uh, was the aspect of flooding. And one of the other parishes that I represented, Melverley, and many of you will know that Melverley is very used to flooding. Ten square miles in that area are regularly flooded, and that's uh, part of the way in which the, the floodplains make sure that there isn't even greater deluge going down the uh, River Vernway and then into the River Severn. Uh, down to Shrewsbury and Bridge North and beyond fulfills a very important function. Who build these wind farms with their huge concrete bases and all the hard standards that will be necessary for the associated activities, the substations, the roadways that will need to service them and inevitably there's going to be more runoff uh, down the hills, down into the tributaries, down into the town at Raleigh, down into the Vernwy, uh, down into the countryside that we know and love and down toward down to Malvoli where just a few centimetres of water can make the difference between water that stays in the fields and water that comes into your house. So another important aspect that we drew attention to. That is the, uh, what I've outlined there is the position that uh, Shropshire Council occupied. Uh, from my own personal point of view, I live very close to the Welsh border. To me, the Welsh countryside is just as important as the Shropshire countryside. I'm sure it is to uh, 
most of the other people who live around here and in this vicinity. It's as important to me, if not more important, than this South Shropshire. It's where I go for enjoyment, it's where our visitors go for enjoyment. Uh, my patch spreads out down the Tannock Valley for five or six miles beyond Lundless and Lundless Crossroads, bordering uh, with Wales all the time, bordering with Cariofa, where the Vernwy and the Tannock confluence is. Uh, all these areas are closely associated with where we live in Shropshire and uh, I think I can fairly say they're as dear to us as they are to you. Um, I, th I would hope that you understand that. Where I come from in the West Midlands, and I'm sure that there are echoes of this for Clive as well, because uh, he's a West Midlander. Uh, the area, that area is very much the playground, the holiday playground for people from West Midlands. It uh, has been for, for, for many, many years. They come here to enjoy it. The prospect of a march of pylons along that valley, crossing and recrossing the Vernley, and then coming into our beautiful shop here is an apparent one. And we stand firmly with you, shoulder to shoulder. Thank you very much. Keith, can I ask you to, to say a few words, please? Um, well, I wasn't intending to speak, actually, <laughs> despite what Arthur says. Um, but the only the thing I really want to say is, um, when you get people and politicians, and politicians like Lyndon and me, coming together and working together, you can achieve wonders. Um, this fight wouldn't have got to where it is today without Charles, um, our friend Jonathan from SNAP. Um, I just can't, I, like Glenn said, I can't believe the time and effort these people have put in taking time out from their own lives to fight this, uh, this, this pylons and wind farm. Um, so can I personally say thank you to all of you for all the work you've done. Um, <laughs> Arthur's put an awful lot of time and effort in as well developing Shropshire Council's response to um, the planning inquiry. But again, we as a council really we didn't have the staff resources or the knowledge to go into the depths that, that SNAP and, and the um, Alliance did. So the, the, the help they've given us in preparing our submission and working with Arthur has been absolutely invaluable. Um, I completely concur with what you said, Glyn, about the, um, the National Grid. I think they're an absolute shower. Um, I've met with them on a number of occasions. The first occasion, they treated me and my councillors with total and utter contempt. They were, t you know, we've got people like Arthur who's the chairman of planning, who knows planning inside out, and they were talking to us like we were children that didn't understand the issues at all. Um, and, and then the, the way they've treated people is equally, dis is equally disgraceful in my opinion. They should be ashamed of themselves. Um, I agree with Glyn, it seems like we're winning, but we've got to keep up the fight. Um, we've just got another application, you may have seen in the press, they want to stick a turbine at the bottom of the brow in Ellesmere. And this one turbine is 100 metres high. And it sounds, um, they tell me the footings will be as big as a football pitch. And that's just on our doorstep. So um, the, the, the battle is against Mid Wales and the wind farms that they've got there. The battle is against the pylons, but it's a continuing battle on our own back guardian because these applications are going to continue coming through. Make no mistake about that. Um, but we as a council are absolutely committed to stand four square with you and with the Alliance and with SNAP uh, to continue the fight. And I think we'll win. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. The support is very, very important to us. Thank you very much. Uh, now there's an opportunity if any of you have questions for anybody who's spoken. Um, we have uh, some friends here from North Wales, I'd like to welcome them. They're threatened by a Scottish power uh, proposal to connect uh, a wind farm um, to uh, a, a 132 KVA line. Um, so we completely understand what they're going through and I hope you know, what you've heard tonight is of some help to you and you realise you're not fighting this alone uh, and people are also affected by Scottish power proposals in, in this scheme so I'm sure there are things that we can share that, that can help each other, uh, I hope so anyway. Um, so are there any questions from, uh, from the floor? Yeah. This is especially for Glenn. 
this, this is basically for you. Is this working? Is it working? Yes. Yes. Okay. Alright, for you then. Uh, is your, you fair enough, um, Dave, David Cameron has said what he said, but it's a relatively easy thing to say coming up to an election about what might happen after an election. How much weight should we really give to this, this statement? Has he really changed his mind? Will a Conservative government or a Conservative government and coalition really do what they say, say they're doing now? Does that work? Now, what do you expect me to say to that? <laughs> Trust me, I'm a politician. <laughs> Actually, the, 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 the only... I mean, it, it is quite interesting. And um, it isn't very often that um, a backbench MP gets 10 minutes called an hour just talking to the Prime Minister, which I did. I mean, yeah, it was just unusual. He asked me to come. I, I, I was expecting there to be a few civil servants in the room with him, but he wasn't. He was on his own. He was, he was actually at the drink. Don't you dare he didn't John like this down. But he was, standing, he was standing by the drinks cabinet and he asked me what I wanted. <laughs> anyway, we sat down. I, I got a long chat. And, you know, and the thing is, if you're ever talking to the... Prime Minister, I mean, it, it, if, if, if he listens, he's not necessarily going to agree with you, but if he listens, that's all you can ask for. Because there's people arguing everything and all sorts of stuff, but he, he listened. And Michael Fallon listened. And the reason I felt pretty confident that um, that's the way we as a party would go is because it is entirely logical. And we're in a coalition at the moment, and I'm not totally convinced that the other coalition partners won't, wouldn't be, are not supportive of the change in the subsidy regime. That is happening. There will be uh, a lump sum to compete for, it will become competitive, the confidence will go, the rocks won't be available to those unless, uh, they need a two-year run-up really, usually for wind farms. It's, I mean, that's all going to happen as part of coalition policy. The, the, the commitments for after the election, I've, he I've heard this before. But I, um, I mean, I think that nearly every commitment David Cameron has made, he's stuck to. And there's, there's been, a, and a lot of this flows from European stuff and the Lisbon Treaty stuff. And he's supposed to have made a great commitment. And that's always been a very false story. I mean, we just had a European election. I don't want to get into an election mode, but the commitment he made on that was that it wouldn't happen if we were in a position to change it, but we weren't. He's made a commitment now on a referendum for Europe in 2017, and people are challenging the truth. There's not the slightest chance that is solid. He's actually said unless he meets that, he won't be um, the Prime Minister. He wouldn't stand there. All I do know is of all the politicians that I've ever worked with, David Cameron is as committed to doing what he says and I think the coalition government and the, the, and the Liberals have played a full-scale part in this. They've stuck with nearly every commitment they made. And when you ask me that question, I, 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 I say frivolously that, what would you expect me to say? But I say that, and I'm not really known for some of you just says anything because I should. I say that because I mean it. I think David Cameron has said that. I think the Conservative Party will absolutely stick to that. And not only that, I think it may well be that the other parties might come around to a similar kind of a position. Because of that, I think UKIP will play their part in this issue. UKIP have got a solid position of anti onshore wind for, for several years. And I think that's played a part. And if, the reason it works is because the people don't want it. We see these ridiculous polls where people are supposed to be in favour of onshore wind. They go into a city and they'll ask 10,000 people who don't even know what a turbine is. And then they, they look at the numbers and they say, oh, isn't this great? That's the, that's the con. Mm. David Cameron is not going to con anybody. David Cameron has given you a commitment and he will stick to it. Thank you, Graham. Do we have any questions about the uh, inquiry process for, for Charles? He's been involved in the inquiry from, from the very beginning. Any questions about that at all? Or any questions for Mabamwe? No? Okay. Oh, uh, sorry, yes, we do have one. One of the fundamental issues. Um, thank you. Nobody wants uh, the pylon runs and, and the wind farms. They're a blot on the landscape. But what we're down to is any comments. The fundamental 
need for more electricity. Um, we're, we're, we have a population that's increasing at a rate of double the size of Birmingham every five years and many thousands more houses being built, all of which need more electricity. <coughs> so the more fundamental issue is we need to reduce the amount of electricity that we consume. And if we were able to do that, then there, there wouldn't be a need for any further production. <coughs> just, just something that you, you may not know and may it wouldn't be of interest is Montgomeryshire is a net exporter of electricity. We already produce 20% more electricity than we use. But I completely agree, we shouldn't be thinking about producing more and more. Our houses are the worst insulated houses in Europe. Um, we constantly look for a next solution to be something that requires a whole lot more electricity. And electricity is going to be more and more difficult to uh, uh, create. But uh, there are other methods of creating uh, electricity which are much less environmentally damaging than this. And it's really important to remember how small an amount of energy you get out of a, a, a 300 foot turbine. You know, you cannot boil a kettle for three quarters of the year. And on that basis, um, it's been uh, worked out that even if you put, you covered the entire Wales, from top to bottom, with wind turbines, it wouldn't produce enough electricity to keep the grid running for an hour. We simply haven't got enough land in Britain to power uh, uh, everything we need from onshore wind. And of course, it's maybe a stupid point to make, but it doesn't work when the wind doesn't blow and you can't store it. So basically, when on a night's nice evening like this, everybody wants to switch on the television and watch Coronation Street. If we were relying on nothing but wind, we would have no electricity. I had a really frightening conversation with a person from National Grid. I've had several frightening <coughs> conversations with people from National Grid. But their, their, um, their backup plan, you might be interested in this, um, they say that what they're going to do uh, is when we're 25% reliant on onshore wind and the wind doesn't blow, they're going to switch off all the commercial fridges. <laughs> Hello, Salmonella, we've missed you. <laughs> what do you think Tesco's Marks and Spencer's going to say if all the chilled food that you're supposed to be having chilled is no longer chilled and is covered in a lovely furry grey mould? You know, <laughs> this is... A technology, and I just had to make a point. I mean, I come from a family where where uh, my grandfather's a coal miner. Nobody would have dug for coal if wind was an a, an acceptable energy source. If you could run a factory from uh, a windmill, nobody would have ever thought of tunneling uh, into uh, hundreds of feet down into the earth. Basically, it doesn't work. But we do need to do something much more serious about conserving energy and reducing the use uh, uh, of electricity. Any of, you, any of you thought that uh, the man was now gagged as she was a member of uh, <laughs> the cabinet you now know was living proof that that's not the case. Thank you very much. Yes? I've got a wonderful idea for fundraising. If this is true, you make it public and get Marks and Spencer and the Tesco's to pay for all <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> I, I remember walking into my milking bar on a very, very cold uh, January morning, 2010. Um, we had a very long cold snap then, uh, then about minus 15. It was completely still for weeks. If we'd have been relying on wind, we'd have been in real trouble because we were using more energy then um, to try and pour everything out than probably we ever did. Um, so it, it really is a nonsense. Uh, just to wrap up, unless there are any other questions, um, I attended a conference along with Digby Davis um, from Class and Fried and uh, Joyce Sisley from MAP a few weeks ago. Um, the title of the conference was Connecting Projects to the Grid. And it was uh, filled with the great and the good from the, uh, the wind industry um, and the, uh, the network uh, uh, power connectors. And we had a presentation from National Grid from Julian Leslie, a senior manager with National Grid. And I was staggered to hear that National Grid have three times more renewable energy that are contracted to connect than they can ever hope to connect. The majority of that was wind, onshore and offshore. So, you know, be aware 
when they try and tell you that this is inevitable, it's far from it. Two thirds of the projects that they're currently now looking at, they know they will never connect. And they're spending huge amounts of money having to do the necessary research um, to no avail and it will come to nothing. So this battle of ours is entirely winnable and please if you go home with one thought, it's that. This is a long, long way from being over. National Grid, as Keith said, are one of the most shambolic companies I've ever had the misfortune of meeting. They really are appalling. And I think partly that comes from their, their huge statutory powers. They don't actually have to be very good because they have immense powers to access land and they have in effect a complete monopoly on, uh, on the network in the UK. So they don't have to be very good, they're not used to and they're not used to being challenged in the way that we're challenging them. And they're really not up to it. So please keep doing what you're doing, keep challenging them. When they want to enter your land, be bloody difficult as I'm being. You know, they have the power to force access but you don't have to make it easy for them. And there will come a point where if they really, really push us too far, you know, we will take them to court and we will see exactly, you know, what they're made of. So many thanks for all your support. Thanks for turning out tonight. Thanks to Clyde for the weather. He's always brilliant. Uh, and we look forward to, you know, continuing this and with, with better news to come. Thank you.